if the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. History doesn't have to be boring, buttoned up, or inaccessible. And it certainly didn't end in 1945. It belongs to all of us, and we share and add to it every day. Welcome to the History of Go-Go podcast, where I interview interesting guests, cover a motley crew of topics, and it's a place where you can sit, think, and drink all at the same time. I'm your host, Rob Mellon. Welcome. My guest today is Dr. Christopher McDonald. He is the senior political scientist at Lincoln Land Community College and a military historian who regularly lectures at the Illinois State Military Museum. He won the Pearson Master Teacher Award in 2001. McDonald has published a number of articles and book chapters on a broad range of topics. In 2015, he published a book-linked collection of letters from the First World War, which he researched and annotated. He is an expert in the study of Great War weapons and artifacts, which will be the topic of discussion today. Welcome, Dr. McDonald. Hi, Rob. Thanks for doing this. This It's really interesting. I think your your topic here is really cool as well. Yeah, it's it's a little strange. You know, I'm a political scientist by uh, uh, training and background, but this sort of... uh, this sort of topic, I think, brings together all sorts of really in- interesting ideas. I mean, including political ones about colonial expansion, but also, uh, you know, chemistry and uh, indus- industrial development and commerce, as well as the sort of military stuff. Doctor McDonald, it is tradition here to accompany the conversation with a special brew. Today, we have an English ale, Bass and Company's Pale Ale. It is known as the world's first pale ale, having been brewed since 1777. By 1877, the brewery started by William Bass was the largest in the world. Trying a bass is like taking a sip of history hundreds of years in the making. If you would like to try this historic British ale, it is available at the Hy-Vee Wine and Spirits in Quincy. Remember, you can suggest a feature beer for a future episode by subscribing to the podcast wherever you get your podcast liking the History of Go-Go Facebook page, and leaving a comment. World War I is often presented as the start of the modern beginning of new technology, but Dr. McDonald, you say that it marked the high point of the most widely used piece of technology, the bolt-action infantry rifle. Right. You know, we uh, when we talk about World War One, we generally uh, talk about all the new things that it brought. Right? Uh, internal combustion engines used, barbed wire, machine guns, and and all, you know the advent of all of that. But um, one of the things that interests me in particular is that it it, it did mark the high point of uh, what had been you know sort of the dominant weapon, and and to some extent remained the dominant weapon with a cu- couple of notable exceptions through the, the Second World War, and that's, as you said, the, the bolt-action infantry rifle. And if you, I mean, if you think about it, to the extent that uh, bolt-action rifles are still in use today in specialized roles, sniper and marksman roles and stuff, um, the weapons that are used are basically uh, identical in design, if not some of the materials, to uh, the, the weapons that were introduced um, just prior to the First World War, so when uh, you know you look at the the Mauser designs and then um, the designs used by Britain and the United States, uh, those are in essence identical uh, in every major form uh, today as they were more than a hundred years ago. So I, yeah, I I think it does mark a high point in that. Well, the British experienced issues uh, which led them to a redesign of their weapons, and so did the United States. Could you speak to what the British experienced in South Africa and then what the United States experienced in the Spanish-American War? Yeah, I mean, you can sum it up in one word, really, Mausers. Um, uh, You know, in in both the Boer War in South Africa and the Spanish-American War, uh, 
Um, the United States the troops were mostly uh, armed with the Krag Jorgensen rifle, um, a, a, you know, a, a decent design, but a fairly old design and a, a little bit uh, complicated. And some uh, some still had single shot Springfield rifles. The British had a very good design, um, the uh, magazine Lee Enfield, but it was a, a long version of it. And um, what they found in the field was that they were, in some senses, outgunned by um, the forces that they were uh, facing. And I think this is probably demonstrated by the American experience at San Juan Hill, where a, a small force of about 750 um, uh, Spanish regulars was able to significantly delay and inflict very heavy casualties on um, a much larger force of American soldiers. Um, and you know what they were facing was uh, versions of the 1893 or 1895 Mauser, which fired a smaller caliber, higher velocity round um, at smokeless powders, so higher rates of fire, more accurate, and it uh, it led both uh, the, the British military and the United States military to take a long, hard look at how they equipped um, their their soldiers. And in fact, it, it led both of them to uh, replace the, the weapon that they had. The, the Americans actually, uh, the United States uh, began the process and, and it ended with the 1903 Springfield, which is, you know, a fairly, a fairly famous and well-known rifle. Um, the British modified their, long end fields, um, eventually adding um, a, a facility to allow a clip loading or charger loading. So you could load the magazine rather than one bullet at a time. You could strip off um, five rounds into the magazine or ultimately 10 in the end field. Um, and, and so what you're seeing is, uh, you know, s some really quite significant shifts there based on that experience. What's really interesting, and to the best of my knowledge, this happened independently, is that both the United States and um, the United Kingdom settled on an intermediate length rifle. So I'm talking about the physical length of the rifle. Previously, what armies had done is had a long rifle for infantry, uh, on top of which, um, you know, a significantly long bayonet was added, uh, in part because there was still thinking that you, that lines of infantry would need to be able to repel cavalry. Um, so you needed you know, a long stick. Um, uh, and then for uh, artillery and cavalry, a short carbine length. So you, you had two versions of most weapons being issued. What the United States did with the 1903 and what the, the British did with what was going to become the SMLE, the short magazine, Lee Enfield, was go for an all-arms rifle, um, an intermediate length uh, rifle. And, you know, obviously that simplified production in a number of different ways. But at the time, it was really fairly controversial because there was, there was thought that uh, shorter barrel meant less accuracy. We we now know with the smokeless powders and smaller calibers, that's not true. Um, but uh, also there was concern about, well, what are you going to do when they face cavalry? You know, the idea that this was being talked about at the same time that machine guns was being introduced is, is a little bit complicated. But you see what happens with both the Springfield and the Enfield. They put a 17-inch long bayonet straight out of the 19th century on the tip of them. So we have this really interesting sort of nexus of uh, experience and, and development. Well, it wasn't uh, – and you can correct me if I'm I'm wrong – I think Theodore Roosevelt, they, they initially had some sort of modified, almost like a, a jabbing stick. It wasn't even like a true bayonet. And then Roosevelt stepped in and said, no, we need the traditional um, long bayonet. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, the Springfield, uh, the very early 1903 Springfields had, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's a spike, like a rod bayonet. Now, in some ways, that's relatively modern. Um and of course, you know, bayonets are 
fascinating and horrific things, um, you know, if you look back through. So the Civil War bayonets were those sort of, most of them, some of them had blades, but most of them fitted on the Patton 53 Enfield were big, long spikes, you know, triangular cross-section spikes. They were mirrored in the 19th century British bayonets on the Martini Henry and things like that. Um, and then blades were introduced. Um, but the, the Springfield so the Krag had a blade bayonet, for example. The first Springfield bayonets were indeed back to spikes. Now, you know, it's interesting because the French continued um, with their on their Lebel rifles to use a big, long spike bayonet, a sort of 17-inch long knitting needle-looking thing. Um, and that's what the first... Uh, the, the first Springfield bayonets were, but uh, I, I'm to be honest, I'm not sure to what extent it was the influence of Roosevelt, um, but certainly those were replaced rapidly with the well by 1903 with the um, the more traditional blade knife bayonet. What's interesting is if you skip forward to um, the Second World War. For example, so Britain continued to use a version of the Enfield in the Second World War, and there bayonets had been reduced to what is in essence a nine-inch nail. I mean, literally just a, a, a nine-inch spike that goes on the end. So some of these things go in um, in cycles, it seems, in terms of what's most appropriate. The soldiers in World War II, the British soldiers, uh, hated the spike because it was no good for anything other right. than being a bayonet. You know, that's what I was going to say as a soldier, because I've spent, you know, 27 years in the army in one capacity or another. And I would say that would be the usefulness of the bayonet, not only um, because if you're fixing bayonet, things are not good, especially in right. modern warfare. So it's really a useful tool. And if it were just a spike, you know, that would reduce the usefulness of it. Yeah. And I mean, it, in, in the First World War, I mean, you, you see that. So in the 19th century, it was actually quite common for bayonets to have uh, along the spine, the back, a serrated saw edge. Now, you know, that, those look horrific and gruesome, and of course they are, but the purpose of the serrated saw edge was not to, I mean, it was sort of a byproduct that that would inflict horrible injuries. The purpose was to allow pioneers and engineers and regular soldiers to flip their bayonet over and saw wood and cut down things for barricades and, you know, useful things. In the second, uh, sorry, in the First World War, the British actually registered uh, official complaints with the Germans, which is a bit of an odd thing to do when you've got poison gas and barbed wire and the horrors of the First World War, but uh, that the, many German bayonets at the start of the war had this saw edge on the back, and it led to, um, by the middle of the war, the Germans removing those saw edges, actually grinding them down or all new produced bayonets um, not having them. So, you know, it's a... Uh, it, it, you're exactly right. There, there were many other uses uh, for the bayonet than what was talked about. As a, as a collector of these things, one of the things that generally amuses me is if you look at the um, the pommel of bayonets, the hilts of bayonets, it is clear many of them have been used for hammering things open and breaking things in ways which probably weren't intended by their designers. Soldiers don't do that, Dr. McDonald. No, no, I'm sure not. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Going back to the uh, Spanish-American War, was it as simple as after, let's, let's take San Juan Hill, for example, which I think might have been Kettle Hill, but either way, you take right, that right. charge. Um, is it as simple as Americans picking up the Mauser and then taking it back to the United States and said, this is something that we need to incorporate into our design? Is it um, that simple? Well, you know, the Mauser design had... Uh, was being, I mean, to put it in terms that, um, you know, a more our era, the Mauser in many ways was the AK-47 of the beginning of the 20th century or the, light, the late 19th century. Mauser was selling their designs all over South America, to Spain, to Turkey, obviously Germany, to Sweden. This design was incredibly uh, successful as a, a both as you know as a weapon, but also as a, a something that was being sold, um, and so it was 
is. I mean, most if you go and buy a hunting rifle today, the vast majority of them are going to be basically a Mauser design. Um, and so, you know, clearly the impact of the Mauser and the small caliber bullet, the, most of them were chambered, um, the Spanish Mausers, the 1893s and 95, 96s, were, were chambered for a, a seven millimeter bullet, which, um, you know, sm- small, high velocity, um, quite a lot of powder behind it, but actually a, a small projectile. So accurate, rapid, r- relatively low recoil, um, all of those things. Uh, so, I mean, I think the soldiers felt the effect of them, but I think weapons designers at, you know, the Aberdeen uh, Proving Grounds or here in Illinois at Rock Island and places like that were quite aware that, hey, this is um, – this is a thing. This is something we need to to look at. And then, of course, the stories from the soldiers came back <clears throat> of Just how they had been outgunned. Just to verify uh, um, what they and, already knew. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think um, to, 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 to say one caused the other, or I, I think, you know, these things are generally a process. It, it's, I mean, there is a connection with what's going to happen later on in the First World War, which is really interesting, that the British decided the the Enfield the the Enfield design um, probably is up there with the Mauser in terms of longevity uh, and, and all of that. But originally it was a single shot weapon. Uh, it had a magazine, but you had to load it one at a time from the top. Um, what was added was this uh, what the British call a charger system, which we know as a stripper system, a stripper clip, where you know you you have your ammunition in five round uh, clips you slide it into the top and then thumb it down and lose the mag uh, load the magazine and throw the spring clip away or if the sergeant majors around put it in your back in your pocket i suppose but you know so you strip it down in there um and that allows for much more rapid reload so what the british did was take their existing design put a charger bridge over the action so that could um happen and shorten the rifle to make it much more handy but otherwise the design stays the same the united states completely redesigned the rifle around a mauser design um with several infringements of mauser's uh, patent patent uh, which they had to pay for <laughs> um but here's the here's the the sort of the the thing where some of this begins to come together at the same time that britain was doing this at the beginning of the um, 20th century, 1907, you know, between 1903 and 1907, so absolutely simultaneous to uh, the U.S. doing it, Britain also began working on a new Mauser-based rifle. Now, this was quite a long process, and it eventually came to fruition in 1913 with a new, a proposed new rifle for the British Army. This was a Mauser design. It was called the, so it used the Mauser bolt action. It was British design, but used the Mauser bolt action. It was called the Patton 13 rifle. And what's interesting about this was that um, that Britain was developing it and also developing a new cartridge. The cartridge was a 0.276 inch or seven millimeter cartridge, but it was much closer to what we might today recognize as a magnum cartridge. So it had um, a lot of powder behind a relatively small projectile. And the plan was that this was going to be the new British rifle. I mentioned that it um, uh, that it was it came to sort of first production, uh, at least for trials rifles in 1913. Obviously, war broke out in 1914, and the idea of introducing a brand new rifle and a new caliber, uh, as opposed to the uh, standard 303 British, meant that that wasn't going to happen. They actually had some problems with the with the cartridge. It um, it was very very hot, and they found that it was causing excessive barrel weather. It was a, the problem was with the cartridge, not with the rifle design. Um, so, you know, Britain puts that on hold and goes with the short magazine, Lee Enfield, which turns out for, you know, for your listeners who've 
seen um, 1917 or watch the wonderful um, They Shall Not Go Old documentary. Um, you know, it's sort of the, the emblematic rifle of the First World War. It has that very distinctive uh, muzzle shape with the, with the project. So Britain went with that um, as their standard rifle. And that actually worked out really well because of the close proximity when you get inside. It's almost like clearing a room when you're in the trenches and having a, a shorter uh, rifle was be would be more useful. Right. I mean, in the confines of a trench, um, that, that shorter length, and, and in fact, all the other armies just started issuing their carbine length ones in much higher numbers. That's what happened in the French army. Um, it's what happened in the German army where they uh, issued many more carbine length rifles, you know, carbines, 98 carbines, rather than uh, the full rifle as the war went on. But Britain was ahead. Also, the, um, the, the advantage that the Enfield had or in these sorts of circumstances that the Enfield had was, although there are arguments about the forward locking bolt system and all of that, it had a 10 round magazine. That's the one thing I noticed um, as such a great advantage that 10 round magazine did that uh, when, when it was implemented into the field, did that have a positive impact? Well, the, the original, I mean, it's complicated, most people are going to say yes, but the, the original magazine Enfield uh, in, of the Boer War had a 10-round magazine, um, but it had to be reloaded singly. Um, and so, you know, there's, you've got 10 rounds that you can fire, but then it's going to take you quite a long time to to put those 10 rounds back in again because you have to pull them out individually and push them in to the magazine. Um with the ad advent of the charger clip, you can do that very quickly. And the British Army, whereas the U.S. Army really emphasized marksmanship uh, in the pre-World War I period, the British Army had a big emphasis on emphasis on marksmanship, but also on rapidity of fire. And there, the, the 10 round, that, that does seem to have been sort of ahead of the game in lots of ways because the, the 10 rounds... Um, was an advantage, yes, absolutely, absolutely. But I, it's difficult to say that the ten round um, on its own brought the advantage. The ten round plus the ability to reload it quickly clearly oh, okay. brought an advantage. Okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it, absolutely. Uh, and and the, the the sort of a a, a follow up to this or a continuation to this which lets us get in, in into some of the other. So Britain put the, the this new rifle on hold and just said, we, we can't do it now. The war's going ahead. Um, but Britain very quickly faced a shortage of weapons in the, in the conflict, massive wastage early on as they're driven back towards the coast. Um, plus there's a giant expansion of the army, obviously with uh, um, volunteers coming in and then later conscription. And so Britain was casting around for second line weapons. And what they ultimately decided to do was rechamber this Patton 13 rifle, the Mauser design, the experimental design for their standard 303 and place contracts with American arms manufacturers to produce them. Um, and so the Patton 13 got renamed the Patton 14, um, now using the standard uh, 303 round. And contracts were let with uh, Remington, Remington, Eddystone, and Winchester in the United States to produce this weapon for the British. Now, clearly, this is sort of politically quite interesting because, you know, at this point, 1914, 1915, the United States is neutral and, you know, Wilson is arguing for neutrality. And yet the United States is producing large numbers of weapons. And if I just run down the list for you, you know, they make rolling block rifles and Berthier rifles for the French. They make a version of um, the Mauser for the Belgians. The Westinghouse uh, and others make Nagants for the Russians. And Remington Winchester and Remington Eddystone uh, make rifles for the British. You can see what's in common there that, uh, I mean, as soon as the war starts, United States manufacturers as commercial concerns are selling weapons to the French, the Belgians, uh, the Russians, and the British. 
all of the Allied side, which you know is an interesting phenomenon in the basis of when we're talking about a, a neutral country. Now, not to de- you know deviate too far from the topic, but in Wilson's perspective, is he just saying, well, those were that's where the contracts were placed. If the Germans want to place a contract with Remington or Winchester, they're free to do it as well. They're just not doing it. Is that his philosophy or is there a true bias towards those countries? I, uh, you know, Wilson's really interesting and there are people um, uh, who are much more expert in Wilson than I. Um, Wilson is clearly an an Anglophile um, in in lots of different ways. Uh, So I think... So publicly, publicly, he would probably say that, but personally, it might be a different story. I think this is largely commercial. I think while the United States is um, is you know politically neutral, and of course, it's very complicated when you've got a country with massive immigration into it from uh, Central Europe, many of whom are from Germany or. Uh, locations which are part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, right? So um, uh, World War One is very, very controversial in the United States because of this. You have large Irish immigration into the United States, where, of course, Britain, and particularly at this period, is not, not uh, necessarily flavor of the month, particularly amongst emigrants who've left Britain, uh, you know, left Ireland. So, um, you know, I think... Uh, declaratory policy and declaratory positions are one thing, but when there's money to be, money to be made, uh, these contracts are going out big time. And this is where, I don't know if we call it luck, fortune, it certainly wasn't really planning, but this has a massive impact in terms of rifles um, when the United States enters the war. So the the story with the Patton 14, this British rifle, is by the time that Remington Winchester and Remington Eddystone get their act together and get get production going, British rifle production has caught up. So um, most of these Patton 14 rifles that the United States produces and ships to Britain – they don't make it to France. They're used for second uh, line training, or uh, interestingly, they go into uh, straight into store. Uh, they do come back out in 1940 and are used uh, largely to arm uh, the Home Guard in Britain. You know, if you Dad's Army, that, that they are largely armed with these Patton 14 rifles. But the, the the real consequence is what happens on the other side of the Atlantic in the United States. These contracts. Um, for the, for the British rifle, are ending at the beginning of 1917. That's when the last deliveries take place. And so just as these contracts for, to the British are ending, the United States is entering the war, and you have this massive, huge expansion of the U.S. military. Right with with the draft and with the creation of the American Expeditionary Forces and the expansion uh, and all of that, and the United States simply doesn't have the weapons. They, I mean, they just don't. In nineteen at the beginning of nineteen seventeen, the United States only had six hundred thousand uh, Springfield nineteen oh three rifles, and we're talking about a military which is going to grow from. A couple of hundred thousand, uh, you know, 1916 to uh, over four million by uh, the end of the war, of whom nearly two million are in Europe. So obviously there is a massive shortfall. The Springfield was a um, a very accurate rifle, somewhat somewhat um, fragile and somewhat uh, touchy, you know, it was. It had a rather complex sighting system um, that was quite easy to, to damage or to knock off. Uh, but above all, it used relatively old production techniques. It was hard to produce. Many of the manufacturers, including Rock Island, had had um, issues with steel quality um, and hardening and uh, had also had just had production problems. So, for example, 
the Springfield rifle, I said there were 600,000 in 1917. By 1918, at the end, U.S. stocks of the Springfield were, were still only around 900,000 or a million. So they'd only really added 300,000 to the stocks. So what was it that armed a giant chunk of the American Expeditionary Force plus many of the people training at home? And the answer is a version of the British Patent 14, which the United States rechambered again for the 30 or six, you know, the 30 caliber round, the standard U.S. round, and set Remington Winchester and Remington Eddystone to produce within the United States. And one of the things about this design is uh, that makes it really modern. It's really the only 20th century design um, of all of the ones we've talked about. It was designed for mass production, um, and it had a couple of other features which um, you know you you will recognise. Uh, so, for example, it had a receiver-mounted peep sight, so a ring and uh, post. Sight. So you had a, a, a preset battle site, which was uh, pre zeroed at uh, 300 yards, and then you had an adjustable longer range site, but it used a peep and the post at the front as opposed to the older barley corn or leaf sites, right? So that meant for target acquisition and for sight radius and all of those technical things, it was a very, very modern rifle. And it was also a rifle which was designed for mass production. It had a simple shape of the stock, for example, that was one piece that the action dropped into. And so just for comparison, the United States had obviously no Model 1917 rifles available in August of 1917 when the contracts ended. And by the end of the war, had uh, 2.3 million of them. That advantage of the zero uh-huh. and the, the site picture and having the battle site zero, to me, that that's an, an incredible advantage. But I was going to ask you, um, when you researched some of the soldiers and you got into some of the, the letters and stuff that I know you have done, uh-huh. did the soldiers have a preference between, and I'll just focus on the American soldiers right now, yeah. between the Springfield 1903 and that new Pattern 17? Yes, they did. Um, and lots of them, uh, particularly the regulars, you know, pre-war regulars, um, lots of them speak of favoring the Springfield. Um, it was shorter and handier. And, uh, you know, so there's that. The, the, it's sort of interesting that the model, the Pattern 14, the Model 1917 is longer and a bit heavier. Um they they did they they had trained on that old sighting system, and so where you find um, where you find preferences uh, expressed in letters, you do often see preferences expressed for the Springfield, and um, I, I, in part, I think that is uh, you know because this is what soldiers trained with and they don't like anything to change right i mean that's that's common to all of us um i think also that you get lots more surviving commentary on things like that from regular soldiers the conscripts who knew nothing else um the the m1917 really proved itself in um in combat as incredibly rugged incredibly accurate there was one weak point on the design there was a, a the ejector spring with a flat stamped piece of steel and that, they, were, they were somewhat prone to breaking um there was a there was a fix for it a replacement part but um you know that's a that that was something that um that the design evolved but the site um and the site picture on the m1917 um, that is clearly superior. I mean, if you know, it, it's a modern receiver site, and I mean, the testament to the superiority of that design is with the O3 A3 Springfield, the World War II continuation of the uh, 1903 Springfield, 
the main difference of which was it placed a receiver mounted peep sight on the Springfield. So, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, your, 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 your point is, is well taken that where there are expressed views, the U S army testing, uh, both after the war and before, um, uh, sorry, during uh, looking at battle reports makes no difference. And, you know, if you look at the production figures and the uh, final government uh, claims at the um, at the end of the war, uh, so the U.S. Statistical Survey of the war says that, quote, American troops were armed with rifles that were superior in accuracy and rapidity of fire to those of either their enemies or their allies. I think they're wrong <laughs> in the rapidity of fire. Uh, because I think the, end, the the UK Enfield action is a faster action than the Mauser action, but certainly in terms of reliability and all of that, they they were. So it is just to pick up on something that you'd mentioned earlier. There was actually one advantage that the model 1917 had over the 1903, which directly comes from the the change of caliber. The uh, the British 303 round is fatter and uh, is a rimmed round. So the magazine well on the Patton 14 held five rounds. When it was redesigned for the 30 or six, it actually holds six. So you have a one round advantage. Now, the rounds were supplied in, in five round um, strippers. So you could charge the magazine, then top it up with one and then of course put one in the chamber so at least on uh, uh, at least theoretically american troops went into who had the m1917 went into battle with seven rounds immediately available rather than six uh, in the standard rifle you know if you've got one in the chamber of a full magazine right I was going to ask you, now this is, uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but uh, I'm going to ask you anyway. So the famous um, event with Sergeant York. What yeah, weapon? I knew we were going to get to you this. <laughs> I'm a, hey, I'm a, I'm a soldier in the U.S. Army. I got to mention Sergeant York. So, uh, yeah. so um, what weapon did he use? Well, the Hollywood movie has him with a 1903. That's what I was going to say. I was going to say, am I, I was, I, I knew that Gary Cooper yeah. used a 1903. Right. But the I Hollywood wasn't sure. movie, you know, I'm, uh, I'm not in public going to join this, this argument um, where I can be quoted and held to it because to be honest, um, I have read hugely lengthy online, online arguments about this. Um, uh, so this is controversy. And, so I just brought. Oh up. yeah, this is this is hot <laughs> stuff, and uh, this is not something where I am. No, it really is. It's one of those, you know, amongst rifle collectors these days and weapons historians and all that. There's there's always this this discussion about what's the best rifle, right? That's the now. I'm not a very tall guy, um, and uh, uh, I'm British, and to me, the short magazine with Hemfield is clearly the winner. I find Mausers uh, with their straight bolt quite uncomfortable to shoot, and I have to break my sight picture to take it down each time I reload, whereas with the Enfield, I don't. You know, there is that. Um, as you've uh, intimated, the uh, American uh, soldiers uh, appear to have really liked their um, 1903 Springfields and talk about its accuracy. And clearly, as the Germans continued with a version of the 98K um, all the way through World War II, and it wasn't supplanted, I mean, to it, on any scale at all by a semi-automatic weapon, that was, you know, something that was in a, 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 an incredible design. You know, the the arguments rage over what was best. And so I think really the argument about Sergeant York is really an extension of those sorts of uh, of arguments. The way to decide it, I suppose, is to look at what his unit was armed with and read his letters. You know, there's a there's a Sergeant York Museum. I'm sure they have um, have an answer to this or weighed in on this uh, down there in Tennessee. 
I, I'm, I, I don't know. The aphorism is, in terms of looking at the different rifles, that the Americans built a target rifle, the Germans built a hunting rifle, and the Brits built a battle rifle. That's a pretty good breakdown. Um, the units that used the 1903 were generally your active duty or your standard units, and then those that got called up by the National Guard and so forth normally used the pattern 17. Is that is that kind of a, a good way to look at it? I think actually, um, I, I think so. Now, the first troops that, well, here's a, here's, a, here's a thing for you. The first U.S. troops that paraded in London in 1917, engineer units. Um, what's really interesting, first of all, it's interesting because those units are the, um, it's the first time you have a, a, a foreign army parading through London you know, for a long, long time. But they're actually armed with Krags. The engineer units that went over, the first units uh, to, to arrive in Britain, um, very early uh, elements of the American Expeditionary Force had Krags. Um, so, you know, they were regular units, but they, they were engineers. They were designed to be doing other things, so they didn't have the frontline weapons. But I think, generally speaking, what you've said is true, with the slight modification that quite a lot of National Guard units had 1903s because they had deployed down to the Mexican uh, border yes. in 1916. So, for example, some of the Illinois units – um, definitely had 1903s when they uh, when they went overseas. But generally speaking, national army, you know, the the, the divisions that were put together with with uh, conscripts, trained with, and went with uh, M1917s. Yes. Now uh, there are also interesting pictures of U.S. troops um, training with Russian Nagant rifles. Because, um, as I mentioned, uh, the United States was producing uh, rifles for um, Russia. Those contracts were cancelled and deliveries stopped in 1917 with the Russian Revolution. Um, and so there were large numbers of uh, 1895 Mosin Nagant rifles produced uh, by uh, Westinghouse and, and Remington um, in the United States. So many. Unit, you, you can find quite a lot of pictures, and for some reason, quite a lot of pictures of units out west training with Nagant rifles. And there's a sort of a postscript to that as well, that quite a lot of the troops, American troops, that were deployed to Russia in 1919, you know, the polar bear force, uh, nominally to protect Allied supplies at ports, but actually um, – operating uh, in support of the the uh, white forces against uh, the the communists with nagant rifles so um you know the, the the sort of there is a continuation of that story too but generally yes national army m1917s original army but of course that all got mixed up um as as divisions were skeletonized and mixed around so the period between the wars then, between World War I and World War II, is there any innovations or did they just revert back and kind of sit on the laurels and no major innovations during that time period? You know, this is beginning at least to move out of um, really my, my area of knowledge. Clearly there are innovations. And so the Garand uh, and the beginning uh, to introduce semi-automatic weapons and submachine guns um, at, you know, as short range, small caliber, pistol caliber weapons. Um, clearly the, um, the Garand and well, to some extent the Johnson and at the very end of the, um, of the first world war, the Browning automatic rifle or the bar, those begin to point the way towards modern semi-automatic and automatic weapons, right? You get the very first submachine guns um, uh, being uh, experimented with at the end of the First World War. Those with things like the Thompson um, and, uh, uh, you know, German, German developments, the MP28 and things like that, those become significant interwar uh, 
weapons developments. In terms of the bolt action rifle, um, the Germans go to a shorter length. So their standard infantry rifle in the Second World War is the 98K, which is a Mauser 98 carbine length, right? Carabiner with a K in German. So you get that. Um, The United States, as I I mentioned, whilst they're developing um, the ultimately incredibly successful Garand, also update the 1903 Springfield, and the update is um, to put a receiver-mounted peep sight on it to make it the 03A3. Um, The British take the Lee Enfield, the short magazine Lee Enfield design, redo it. Um, for mass production. So they put a slightly heavier barrel, a slightly different stocking system, and a receiver-mounted peep sight on it. And that becomes what's known as the, it's introduced in the late 30s and becomes the standard British infantry rifle, actually up through Korea, which is the number four rifle. Um, You know, the, the Russians become the Soviets, don't do very much at all. Their World War II rifle is, again, a slightly shorter, but not very much, um, and slightly recited Mosin Nagant that becomes the 9130 rather than the 1891. Um, and towards the very end of the war, uh, 1944, the, the Russians make huge numbers of a carbine length version of that. So that's the M1944. Um, But the real change comes with the semi-automatic rifle. And then by the end of World War II, with the introduction of what we would recognize today as quote unquote assault rifles, um, where the Germans introduced one, the United States have introduced one relatively early, the M1 carbine, you know, a carbine length firing a, a, a sort of slightly enlarged pistol cartridge. The Germans introduced one um, with the MP44. And um, ultimately, of course, the um, uh, the, the Soviets introduced the, the Simonov, the, the SKS, uh, and the, the, the sort of AK form of families. So that's, you know, that's your whole picture there. But in terms of my area of any knowledge, the bolt action rifle, the, the, you know, the bolt action rifles that the United States is deploying, um, things have changed slightly today, uh, but certainly through, uh, through the end of Vietnam and up through a Remington 700, for example, the sort of thing that um, police departments and SWAT teams use versions of and all of that is really that Mauser action. It, it, it's, it's not fundamentally different. There are experimental ones around it, and I can hear all the real firearms experts listening to your podcast gnashing their teeth and saying, what about, what about, what about? But I, I'm talking sort of on, on the big picture that, no, I, apart from materials and obviously um, industrial capacity to make things much more precisely with computer, computer controlled machining and all that, um, the, the design of a bolt action, a high end bolt action rifle today would be instantly recognized by soldiers of the First World War. They might marvel at the you know, high density plastic stocks and the fancy um, optical sights that we put on them. But the mechanism of the rifle, I think, would be recognized by in the hands of um, a German soldier, a British soldier, an American soldier um, in the First World War, for sure. So when they develop this type of technology for the rifles, is it top secret so they don't want to even share it with the allies? So not to get, like as you mentioned, you're not really an expert in, in uh, World War II weaponry. But for the grand, it seems like it's such an advancement. Does the United States share that with any of the allies, with the British? Um, well, I mean, they sold grands to the allies in, in, in some numbers. Um, uh, Britain didn't develop. Um, a, 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 a mass use semi-automatic rifle until the 50s. Um, 
so uh, you know there are patents on various designs and i mean once you put things on the battlefield they're not top secret right um right. but uh, because they fall into the hands of the enemy and then the enemy take them apart and figure out what's going on but but i think one of the things is that knowing how it works is one thing tooling up to mass produce it is uh, not something that can happen very quickly and so um you know with the exception of extremely protracted conflicts that's perhaps not a concern i mean there the were things so for example i think i'm right in saying that the browning automatic rifle the bar um which has a very long service in u.s history it's a model 1918 but i think the numbers that were deployed to the um, frontline soldiers one was restricted because it was a new weapon um, but two i i believe i'm right in saying that there was some hesitation um, by the americans to deploy those as soon as they had them and, and you know until they were available in sufficient numbers for the sorts of reasons that you were talking about um there was another interesting development which was something called the peterson device um and the peterson device or pedersen i think it's actually a d pedersen device um which uh was an insert for the m1903 which which Basically, you replaced the bolt with what was, in essence, a semi-automatic pistol and then um, inserted a pistol caliber magazine up through the bottom. And it made the, um, made the 1903 Springfield a semi-automatic pistol firing weapon. Uh, the idea, it, at least in theory, was that the soldiers would you know have their full caliber weapon while they're defending trenches and when they but when they go into an attack and are jumping into enemy trenches they will take out the bolt from their rifle insert this peterson device clip in um, a magazine of pistol caliber rounds short you know short range pistol size rounds and then use it as you were talking about for that close combat trench weapons it essentially becomes a rapid fire semi-automatic weapon it was uh, they were produced they um uh, were produced in in reasonably large numbers in late 1918 but never made it to um never made it to use they were tested and used at rock island and places like that but they never made it to france um they're, they're really scarce these days they that there are very few of them in existence. They do have one at the museum at Rock Island, but um, what was made in huge numbers and um, still survives and are relatively easy to find are the cases for the the, the webbing cases for them. Which um, there was a special case that you put your 1903 bolt in, and then there was a magazine case that held um, I think four of these. Um, pistol rounds, uh, magazines, and the Peterson device itself. Those are, um, you know, show up all the time around the place, and they're inv invariably dated 1918 or 19. So there were some sort of interesting innovations. It, it never went into, it, it, it never saw action, however. So my last question for you, Dr. McDonald, is, so if they produce all of these weapons and then the war ends, what happens to all those weapons? Millions of weapons. Okay, yeah. And so, um, it, in in the British case, the Pattern Fourteens go into store. Some get sold to the um, Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, and stuff in the interwar. Some get supplied to India, but most of them are sitting in warehouses until 1938, 1939, when war looks imminent. In which case, they're pulled out, degreased, cleaned up, and issued as second line weapons. In the United States case. Um, the M1917 went into reserve. They were used um, uh, by Marine units and various other units very early in um, World War II. Uh, quite a lot, uh, quite a number were bought by Britain um, in 19, 
40 and then supplied under Lend-Lease by the United States to Britain and Canada um, prior to the United States entering the war. So um, the United States had large stocks of M1917s, which they uh, pulled and sold out. Um, and they were also supplied uh, post-war to, uh, I think, uh, Denmark and Norway, and uh, they were supplied to the um, government sides in the Greek Civil War. They were supplied um, in various forms to uh, Israel. So generally speaking, they're held as reserve. I think the M1917, if I'm remembering correctly, was officially declared obsolete in the US and sold off. Large numbers went into the civilian marksmanship program and were sold on you know, the open market in 1947. Um, so Britain disposed of its stocks after uh, the Second World War. So you know, these huge numbers are produced. You asked about innovation in the interwar period. To some extent, obviously, you have um, the global financial crash, uh, the depression, and all of that. Militaries uh, don't get to develop new weapons when you've got millions of weapons in supply and you're facing this giant financial crash. So lots of them sit in storage um, uh, and, and are dusted off and used. Um, the United States supplies M1917s to the Philippines, for example. And so the Philippines Armed Services have those um, uh, in their fight against the Japanese and, uh, and all of that. So they're, they're, they're sold on once they are not um, frontline weapons for the United States and for Britain, sold on down the line. The one thing that we, I mean, I mentioned the, the, the commerce and diplomacy neutrality stuff. But, I mean, the thing that goes at the beginning in some ways is chemistry. And this happens at the so so it sort of this prompts almost all of the things we're talking about, and that is the development of smokeless gunpowder. And so smokeless gunpowder, um, so the first rifle developed to use smokeless gunpowder as opposed to adapted to smokeless gunpowder um, is the French Lebel in 1886. Um, and that's developed to use smokeless, you know, smokeless powders, make a huge difference on the battlefield. Muzzle velocities increase, therefore um, ranges increase, and you no longer get huge clouds of smoke every time you fire the weapon. So it suddenly becomes much more important to wear drab and camouflage and olive and field gray and all of these things. And rapidity of fire goes up and accuracy over range goes up. So that chemical development in the late 19th century of smokeless gunpowders, which develop higher muzzle velocities and um, don't obscure the battlefield in huge rolling clouds of you know, the fog of war, um, that has a spurring effect to all of the rifle designs that we might talk about and the changes um, that we see going forward. And that that's that's something which sort of because it's it's chemistry and it's laboratory and it's not um, front and center in everybody's mind. It's very, very significant. If you compare images of battles in the late 19th century for you know, mid to late 19th century American Civil War battles um, with First World War and the differences that we see there. So yeah, I think that's a significant element. Well, thank you, Dr. McDonald. Yep. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been uh, been a lot of fun. I'd like to thank my guest today, Dr. Christopher McDonald. If you would like to purchase his book, it's available at the gift shop at the History Museum on the Square in Quincy, located at 4th and Main. The feature brew was the historic British ale Bass & Company Pale Ale, the very first pale ale in the world. The best way to listen to the podcast is actually go grab the featured beer, and join the conversation. Remember, you can suggest a feature brew. Just subscribe to the podcast, like our Facebook page, and leave a comment. If yours is selected, you will win a $10 gift card and a shout-out on the next episode. 
The music was provided by the great Bones Fork. They're working on a new album right now, so new music is coming soon. Thanks for supporting us, and join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink on History of Go-Go. Go-Go.